So welcome to the podcast, David. It's great to have you here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Been a been a long time. <laughs> so for those who aren't familiar with you, give us a bit of a background on yourself in terms of your context, how you kind of first got involved in sport as a youngster and how that's developed into the, the roles and careers that you're, you're doing today. Yeah, sure, I suppose. Um, look, I was, I was very fortunate enough to be part of a very sporty family. Both my, my mother and my father played a wide variety of sports, you know, rug, rugby, running, tennis, golf, hockey, whatever it was, you know, whatever was going, they'd play it. Uh, and as a result, we got exposed to a lot of sports at quite a young age. So the majority of, of my, not just mine, but my family's childhood was going from a, a Gaelic football pitch to a rugby pitch to collect someone. And I feel sorry for, for feel sorry for mum and dad, essentially taxis along the way. But um, yeah, look, I, like I said, it's, it's been a massive part of my life right from the start. Rugby probably definitely took, took the biggest hold on me throughout my school um throughout my school life and then across into university life and, and back playing a bit of Gaelic football now to to keep the legs stretched <laughs> so how did that kind of initial uh, I guess exposure to various sports lead into nutrition and and sports science and what you're doing today what how did that kind of thought process un- unfold yeah I mean that's that's quite an interesting one I was always interested in in sport and probably you know, at a youngster, you don't really understand performance. You just kind of understand people getting better or not better, or, you know, somebody stronger than somebody else. And you, you kind of trying to pick it apart, but you don't really think about strength and power development or anything when you're, you're 12. Um, but I think as I got into secondary school, I got particularly interested in, in how to improve, uh, both on a personal level and then just out of, out of pure interest. You know, why were some people where they were? Uh, and some people not, despite maybe potentially having similar trajectories uh, at a younger stage. So that kind of really sparked my interest in both, to be honest, both strength and conditioning and nutrition. I was, I was equally at that point as interested in both sort of what could be done away from just being on the training pitch in a, in a rugby or a GAA setting to then amplify what you could do there. Um, now, that also, it also helped the fact that at school, I was particularly strong at maths and biology and I was awful at languages and history. So I think it kind of, uh, I naturally got pushed in such a way that, you know, life sciences and, and maths were, were suited to me. Um, but yeah, when it came to, you know, history and, and that kind of thing, I, I didn't think there was any, any further education in there for me. So um, I think a combination of those two was just, just pure interest and probably a, a natural tendency to be better in those subjects. And I suppose from there, I just tried to explore opportunities from school. Uh, in Ireland at the time, there was very little sports performance degrees. Um, back when I was 14 or 15, I was quite lucky to be exposed to some high level sport and do, some, I suppose, some placements even at that age, just to go inside and you know spend a week with people, look behind the scenes, what was going on in elite sport. And sort of, you know, 15, 16, I managed to spend a couple of weeks in Leinster uh, on a placement, uh, Leinster Rugby at the time, to, to get a bit of a feel for it. And over sort of 17, 18, 19, 20, I tried to keep getting different experiences, you know, at the start of university and throughout. And when I started university, I kind of, I still wasn't sure whether I wanted to be more of down the S&C or sports science route or nutrition. And then after all the placements and spending that long in the gym all day, I realized I definitely didn't want to, to do that <laughs> on a personal level. It took the enjoyment away from training a little Got bit. Kind of reps. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, stuck, stuck to the nutrition and, um, yeah, I really enjoyed it from there. But to be honest, like I said, in Ireland at the time, there wasn't that many sports performance degrees. So I, I jumped ship to, to go to the UK and went to St. Mary's to do my undergraduate in, in nutrition and sports science, where I met yourself amongst I suppose many other people now that are are working across various levels of of elite amateur and, and recreational sport and yeah just just kind of went from there really so obviously nutrition's kind of one of those industries where people tend to hold multiple roles at once like it's obviously consultancy roles at different clubs or with different individual athletes so give us a bit of an overview of the different variety of roles that you've had across different places yeah I mean it's um there's, there's been quite a variety at this stage, but it is interesting. I mean, a lot of organizations feel like they need a nutritionist 
not all the organizations necessarily know what they want from the nutritionist, but they go, well, we work in professional sports, so it's important we have a nutritionist. So as a result, there are some consultancy roles that probably aren't optimized. You know, in an ideal world, depending on the size of the squad, if, if you look at professional rugby teams nowadays, you know, between 40 and 60 players, realistically, a, a full-time nutritionist is required to, to help each of those players with their individual requirements, um, as well as the development of some of the younger athletes throughout their early stages of development. But that's not the way it is. Generally, it is, it's, it is quite a consultancy role and there might be target players within any group. So my personal experience in sport, um, I suppose I started off, uh, my very first, first role was in the Harlequins Academy. So I was doing some work with their I suppose, under 12 through to 18. So some, some general nutrition education and more food education than anything at that stage, just understanding, uh, you know, what types of foods can do what sort of different things for to help them recover and fuel and, you know, nothing too heavy on the science. And, and pretty quickly after my undergraduate degree, I was lucky to get a role up at Bradford Bulls. So working in the Super League. So I remember the the long journey from, from London up to Bradford a couple of times a month. Um, and that was great. They, you know, I learned more from those guys than they learned from me a hundred percent, you know, great bunch of lads, great, great experience and, and a great club. So yeah, thoroughly enjoyed my time there. Went from rugby league and started to pick up a few roles, like you said, alongside it. So I was at British fencing at the time as well. Um, never come across fencing before that experience, but again, great to learn all these different requirements, different um, physiological stresses that are happening and psychological stresses um, that go along with these different sports and, and characters. Um, at the same time, I sort of picked up a, a gig in QPR at the academy working in football and then sort of progressed from the academy over the next few years to the first team, which is probably a similar trajectory so, to what happened at Harlequins over those few years, um, as and when the, the nutritionist who was there moved on to, to other things. And I suppose a few other little bits and bobs that have happened along the way have been a, a stint, well, a continual stint. I'm still there with, with British canoeing. So again, really enjoyed, really enjoyed that Olympic program. Some, some great coaches, some great athletes, so just, just some great people there to work with along the way. Uh, mentors for me on a personal level and just, you know, friends I'm still friends with today. So started off with the sprint program and um, now with the slalom program and still do a little bit of, of golf stuff on the side with the European tour and, and the Ryder Cup. Mm. So pretty varied experiences there, like individual sport, team sport, Olympic sport. How has that affected your kind of uh, coaching practice? Like, is there any people that stood out as being really pivotal experiences or any, you know, the experience of Olympic cycle, does that stand out? Like, is there anything that you could kind of point out to as being milestones in your development as a nutritionist? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Like, look, I'm really fortunate to get, to get the exposure that I've had. And if there's any practitioners that are listening who are recently graduated from university, don't feel like, oh, I want to work in football or rugby because that's what I play or do. Like, get, get the exposure it really helps that your, your thought process um, and the ability to crink, uh, think critically about situations. So I think outside of any individual experience just at the minute, I think the, the pure breadth of exposure massively helped me think better about how I approach uh, my practice. And I think there's, there's some fundamentals that exist across the board, which are at the end of the day, you're dealing with human beings and if you want to get the best out of them, don't treat them like a number or an athlete. You know, you have to treat them like a human. You have to, you have to be able to listen and understand and express empathy with the people that you're working with to then build trust and build that relationship so that they can actually let you in um, to help them. You know, some people are very much, tell me what to do, I'll do it. But I would say they're more the minority, even in elite sports, than you know, from, from what I've come across. I think you see it a little bit more in, in individual Olympic sports, those personalities that are like, you know, they only have themselves to rely on, so they're going to give it everything. But in team sports, some people are there just because they're, they're really talented at that particular sport. And it's not necessarily that they've tried harder than anyone else. They're just genetically, genetically gifted and that's their route. So, um, yeah, I think out, outside of the, some of the generics, some experiences, I was 
being part of the, the British canoe team was a fantastic experience for a number of levels. There was athletes and still is athletes that are highly engaged. Um, they're, they're good thinkers about their own training as well. And, and as, a, as a result, they're great to be involved in that decision-making process continually throughout. But the staff have always been great. Um, I've had some, some very good friends that I've worked with um, who I'm still friends with now and I work with on other projects um, as well as some mentors. You know, there's, you know, I've had one mentor there, or my line manager, Brian Kniff, who's been there for, for quite a while now. And you'd go into meetings with Brian and he'd ask questions and you'd still be thinking about it three days later to start to wrap your head and unravel, which, which was great. Really, you know, for me personally, all those questions definitely made a massive difference in, in how I think and how I would approach. But yeah, I think the exposure in and of itself, I think the, the different people asking you different questions in different ways and getting you to think about different situations or similar situations differently have helped. Um, one Harlequins player has also jumped out along the way where we did have uh, one, one player, is, again, he's a good friend now and he uh, probably was one of the people that sparked me wanting to do a PhD where I remember sitting down in the team room talking to him the day before a game and everything was lined up and it was great. It's like, look, this is the plan. We have everything. We've listened. We see all of this. And it's like, yeah, do you understand? Yeah, look, it all makes sense. I'm into this. And then he said something and I was just like, after he said this, I was like, where do you, where do you go from here? And he just kind of, he just looked at me and he was like, I know what to do. I'm just not going to do it. And it kind of makes you think, it's like, well, we've educated you. There's the rationale, you get it. Like what's, what's missing? Like why? It's not that it doesn't fit into your life. You know, we've looked at your lifestyle and, you know, your likes, your dislikes and your timings and, you know, budgets and family situations and all of that. And, you just kind of, that, that one kind of hit me and it kind of goes, right, what are we doing here? Uh, and that really got me interested in behavior because it's not something we're ever taught about at university. And actually, you know, for somebody, you know, now I would know a lot more to say, well, there would have been a motivation issue. It wasn't a capability issue. It wasn't a, an opportunity issue. There was a motivation issue lacking. And there would have been, as a practitioner now, there are different ways I could attack that now. But back then, it just kind of goes, you know, hands in the air, right? Where, where do we go from here? But that one stood out as, as one that definitely shaped my, my interest more in academia, more than anything else. It's really interesting because, like you say, looking back, people might say, well, you know, these, these environments are so unique. Like we all like to think that, you know, rugby's different to other sports or football's different to other sports, but you know, you've got experience there across fencing, canoeing, football, rugby, rugby league. Um, but the commonality is you're dealing with human beings and human behavior isn't as yeah. simple as calories in calories out. And, you know, measuring your macros, like you said, there comes a point where actually the plan is not the problem. It's, it's the, what's happening between someone's ears and, and their willingness to change or their motivation to change. So how, is, how has your coaching philosophy in terms of coaching nutrition and coaching behavior change evolved since that period in time? Yeah, I suppose, that, like, like anyone, you, you young book out of university, you kind of think you have all this knowledge and you've got your, your classics sort of done in Kruger. It's, I'm going to put all these slides together. All the information is here. I'll be able to give them everything they need. And once they have that for me, they'll be able to do it. Uh, and like you said, you're dealing with humans, um, you know, as a species, we're irrational, we're emotional, um, things like motivation can change, if, you know, multiple times a day, multiple times a minute. Um, it can be altered in response to external cues, internal cues. So I think more than anything, it's how everything has changed is kind of I've just really taken a step back when it comes to everything. I, I wouldn't look at it as simple as you go in and you deliver your education. It's, it's not a box tick. It is a journey. It is about building trust and building relationships. Um, I think relatedness with, with athletes is massively important. And it certainly allows me to do more as a practitioner over time. So I would say, look, I've, I've always tried to show that I care 
and you know tried to go the extra mile but I think understanding how to approach situations differently now I think in terms of the interventions that we deliver they've just really expanded beyond education and training it's no longer about you know giving people the plans the powerpoints the cooking lessons but it might actually be about how we how we restructure an environment how we phrase certain messages how how i support or keep them accountable to certain things in the language i use um and i, I suppose really a lot of it has come around how you also target motivation more than anything else and you know how you look to target mode like reflective or or automatic motivation and reflective is definitely easier for us to to pinch in on um and it's look it's still not an exact science like there i mean there's some really interesting research and i really like this one out of uh, the netherlands a woman called um elena smith who looked at autonomy and basically she looked at autonomy in the, the dutch population who were using mobile apps to improve their health and she did a latent class analysis and, and really found four categories or three primary categories of people you kind of had these self reliers that you left them to do what they wanted to do and um they were great they could run with their own health program they don't need much help from an expert like me or or anyone else you had confirmation seekers people that they just needed the verification like is this the right thing to do and once they have that they can go away and keep going until they need verification for something again and then you had the expert dependents people that benefited most from that that hand holding period they need us more um and there was a fourth category of indifference but it was a much smaller proportion of them and i think you know reading research like that it really makes you think you know what information have we never considered capturing about people to actually understand how we can work with them better you know even that alone if i knew that somebody was a confirmation seeker i wouldn't waste my time trying to chase them the whole time i would make sure that they're happy and confident knowing what to do and that they will then be able to go away and we can look to support them and keep them accountable but we don't need to i suppose push the support too much it's more on a they'll let me know when they need me whereas if you've got someone that's an expert dependent you might look to then give them more time so i i still think psychologically there's there's a huge amount of information we're not we haven't considered properly capturing in this area that could massively help how we how we target our interventions and and how we work with people um so i think you know psychology certainly in in sports nutrition is i think it's it's growing and it's evolving and we're seeing more research in in behavior change unfortunately a lot of the research we're seeing is it's kind of the entry level research which are basically we're looking at the absence of sports nutrition in the literature or what could be done but we're not actually seeing many interventions to push us forward so hopefully over the next few years we see people that are actually just going out and testing the assumptions so we can learn a little bit more do you think that those kind of four categories of people as well do you think people transition along that almost like as a continuum as they develop in their own knowledge like you know is someone at the beginning you know, a bit like we talk about behavior change and stages of behavior change. Do you think people go, you know, from being an expert dependent to maybe confirmation to someone who's more self-reliant as they develop in their understanding and their practice? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't think you can take those, the categories from the paper and then apply them broadly across everything. I think like anything, um, you know, context is, is important to keep with these things, but um I don't think something like autonomy changes massively from what I've seen. I think this is more of an innate characteristic where you, you might have somebody that knows a lot less about something and as a result they might want to find information from somebody at that point. But I don't think that would change their innate want for or need for autonomy mm -hmm. uh, in in certain aspects, but yeah, it'd be interesting, interesting to look at, but I would I would certainly think that if someone's pretty pretty stubborn and they're like look i know what i'm going to do this myself i don't see them massively changing um unless there's been a big intervention put in place hmm. 
So tell us a bit about your own research, because obviously you, you know, you're f now finishing up your own PhD. So talk, tell us a little bit about, you know, you obviously mentioned piquing the interest that, that pointed you towards that. What was the, the kind of ambition going into the PhD of what you were looking to, to investigate? Yeah, so I mean, there was a number of things. There was definitely the how can we be more effective was, was definitely one. And the effective was, was probably coming at it from two angles. There was coming at it from that angle of somebody's just told me I know what to do, but I, I'm not going to do it. So there's something missing in my armor. You know, how can I understand this a bit more? But it was also at the same time that, that social media was really sort of coming to the forefront. And I was spread quite thin across a few organizations and had relied on private social media channels to deliver information remotely and try and engage people in, um, I suppose, prompting or nudging certain nutrition behaviors. And, and it was going quite well. So I was also quite interested in what was going on there. Like I haven't been in for two weeks, but people are still moving in the right direction. And actually this can be quite an efficient way of working. And it was probably like early stages of, of what I'd now call hybrid coaching, which is that we kind of had this digital arm and then we had this, this physical arm and I was really interested to investigate that a little bit more so we started off just by basically understanding was this commonplace were many people adopting these digital technologies into their practice and you know how do they feel about them so really what we found from that was that we really looked through quite a large proportion of, of nutritionists in the UK and Ireland who were working at an elite level and we found that 89 percent of them were were using these digital technologies. Nobody was taught to use them. This was very much a ground up movement. Um, but a lot of the people that were using them reported that it was taking a lot of time. They weren't trained to use them and they were really interested to optimize their effectiveness. So we kind of built on that and spoke to athletes and we kind of figured out from athletes, like what's your current perception of nutrition delivery? And, you know, what are your thoughts on, on digital delivery and practice? So that was really interesting because it, and I'm still writing up that paper. So we've got the results together, but in, like in, in a nutshell, I'm not sure how much we'll all, we'll make it out into the next publication. There might be bits that'll go into this publication and then other bits that, that are framed a different way. There was a couple of things that jumped out, which was that a lot of athletes felt like they were getting a generic service that the nutritionist was spread too thin and that it's hard to get the person because they're limited on time. And as a result, we see the same slides every year. Um, you know, we get this stuff that's not tailored to me. And that really rang through in academy sport in particular, um, and also in female sport. Female sport was was really, really badly underserved, which is which is a problem that that is you see it starting to be corrected now. Um, and just to say, I suppose when I say badly underserved, not at an Olympic level, but more at a team sport level. Um but there still needs to be a lot more done to support female athletes. So that was interesting as well, because they gave us some insight into what would be useful for them. And really where we've gone from there is we've listened to the practitioner's pains and we've listened to the athlete's pains and tried to come up with a solution that allows a human nutritionist to deliver predictive, personalized, periodized nutrition support tailored to the, that individual um, I suppose that's scalable and continuous. So if I've got one athlete that I'm working with, or I've got a thousand athletes that I'm working with, can they all get that simple, easy to follow nutrition structure that fits their lifestyle, their goals, their performance. And, and so we invested time building that so that we had more time for humans to actually be human, speak to the athletes, build relationships and get into the finer details around interventions or strategies that they might be looking to implement so that's kind of yeah led to that point now where we've we've built a new app at the minute it's being used for research purposes between liverpool john moore's university college london and duke nus in singapore we ran a pilot before christmas so we did a 12-week trial there was just over a thousand elite athletes that took part in that which was which was awesome and yeah now we're really just sort of working through the backlog of data to to figure it all out um so hopefully some exciting publications coming soon but i think more than anything with the phd the motivations just going back to it like i said about trying to be more effective it's being more effective in my practice 
how can I make the most of my time as a human? But then how can we also increase our effectiveness as a whole and, and actually deliver scalable interventions that can have much larger impacts beyond the four walls of the, the training ground? Hmm. No, I guess that makes a lot of sense, because like you say, you know, there is a bit of a need for generic you know, resources, maybe at an educational level, like you said, the food education, you know, everyone needs to understand protein, carbs and fats, but, you know, the more, you know, uh, I guess, educated you become and the more differences appear, like people having, you know, whether they're omnivore or they're pescatarian or whatever, things start to divert, but then training schedules are different. And, you know, there is a need for more individualization, isn't there? Whereas a lot of things don't offer that. Yeah, hundred percent. Everyone's different. Everyone's training schedule can be different people's perception of effort of certain sessions can be different and and as a result it's really important to, to fuel that individual um their likes their dislikes and, and also give them a bit of autonomy within the program as well i think it's important that athletes have a say in what they want to do no one likes being told what to do um and if you can provide something that's simple and easy to follow can be distilled down into something quite intuitive then, then you're on to a winner. And, and really that's what we tried to do with, with some of the, the periodization work that was being done out of Liverpool already. So you had Dr. Sam Impey who did his PhD in it. Um, you've had James Morton or Professor James Morton who's been working in that space for years. John Bartlett who's gone before him. Mark Harris has done a lot of work and Kelly Hammond again. Everyone's sort of contributing to the literature base in this space. And we wanted to build something that actually made it easier for people to periodize their nutrition the same way they periodize their training to actually allow them to optimize their performance, but also amplify their training adaptations. Um, and that's, yeah, that's what we've built at the minute. So we're, look, I'm super excited to get it out later this year. Anyone that is interested can, can definitely get in contact for sure. We have, we have a pretty cool product there that we're, we're excited to share and plenty more research to be done data is everything at the minute hmm. so that's the hexus app we're talking about yeah yeah so the app is called hexus um really like i said it's a it's an academic spin out so we've got um senior research associates in behavior change myself sam dr sam impey's involved um we also have people in medical statistics bioinformatics um computer science data science ml ai we, it's a good team um, and we've worked together, I suppose, previously academically. And that's kind of led to led to the birth of this, which is, which has been fantastic, but hopefully we can just help, help athletes all over the globe, just fuel smarter. So what does it look like for the end user? So, if, you know, as an athlete using the app, what does that look like? Is it just, you know, a, a database of recipes or is it more, you know, in depth and more prescriptive? Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely more in-depth and more prescriptive. So myself, Sam, uh, and Xiao Shi, who's based over in Singapore, we, we kind of spent about two years between us looking at different types, intensities, durations of training, time available to fuel for, as well as recover from different meal patterns. And, and we put together an algorithm that will essentially ingest your, your training information, your activity, um, your physical build and your lifestyle, and it will automatically produce a periodized nutrition plan. So whatever I put in for the week. So just to take it through it, let's say I'm on the app. I have a profile. I'll input my training plan for the week. It will in less than two seconds, spit out a personalized predictive periodized nutrition plan using a, we call it a carb coding system. So a sort of a traffic traffic light system for sort of low, medium and high carbohydrate and energy meals standardized protein in the background and all of those carb codes are actually interactive buttons that are linked to lists of tailored recipes that fit your individual requirements so we have a database now of, of over 1250 recipes and the way that i suppose that algorithm will work is training plans change so if you go in and you edit and your session is moved your session is cancelled the intensity was harder than you thought it was going to be everything will be done in real time so you know you just just let us know the plan let us know how it went or if it changed or if it didn't change and and we'll be able to provide you yeah real time information on how you should be altering your nutrition in line with your activity mm. that's fantastic because so often you know 
nutrition can seem really helpful, but then it's the, the application that's the element. You know, when people talk about 100 grams of carbohydrate or 150 grams of protein, they go, okay, brilliant. I know what I need. But now what does that look like when I have breakfast? Or what does that look like post-training? Or, you know, it has to be translated to food. It has to be. It has to be also translated to food that you're likely going to have and you're willing to cook. You know, there's nothing worse than going, look, I've made this recipe for you. Here are the 25 ingredients you need. And you go, I'm, I'm not doing that. Like, this is what I have in the fridge. We want it to be short, simple, tasty, uh, and easy to follow. They're, they're some of the big things because adherence is everything. 100%. Yeah. Definitely. So, so, you know, looking a little bit more broadly, what are your thoughts or, or recommendations in terms of like nutrition for youth athletes specifically? Are there any kind of generic guiding principles or skills or even pitfalls that you come across? Yeah, I suppose one pitfall I'd say I'd see in a, I'd say a, a later stage teen is, you know, they think that they're, you know, going to become a professional athlete and they go, I need these supplements. And I think there's people can look for perceived shortcuts that just don't exist. There's no need for that. Um, so I think that's certainly a pitfall is looking for, you know, looking for a magic pill that the pros get paid a lot of money to promote. So just because you see, your superhero on a uh, a banner using a product, you know, a they they're either getting paid a lot of money, or they've got some shares. So, you know, take it with a pinch of salt. But definitely for youth athletes, I think if there was one thing that they any youth athlete I've, I've ever worked with, I would say would recommend them benefiting from at some stages. Learning to cook at a young age is a big thing, because if you do make it, you're going to leave home. You're going to be on your own in digs or, you know, depending on how good you are, you might get a great contract, but unless you're in the NBA or the NFL, you don't have a chef living at home for you. Um, so you got to, you got to learn to cook and you got to learn to prepare food. Simple meals are absolutely fine and just be able to make it tasty so that you enjoy it. So yeah, any youth athletes get out, learn to cook two or three basic dinners, two or three basic lunches, two or three, different types of snacks and two or three breakfasts and that in and of itself will stand you in good stead and if you can experiment every now and again fantastic mm, no i completely agree so for are there any sort of resources you would point people towards um you know in this kind of domain you know it might be a book a podcast your social media accounts i know you post a lot of recipes on there so what sort of things spring to mind for for coaches or for parents that you might say you know this is a useful place to start yeah, I suppose for, depending on the level and the stage of the athlete, um, you know, they might be involved in cooking classes through an academy or, or whatever that might be. I think, look, social media is a dangerous thing because there can be a lot of misinformation out there. You can create an echo chamber of, of messages that are, are factually incorrect. But then at the same time, there are lots of great, there are lots of great resources out there. So I think if you're careful and you kind of curate your list of, people that are good with food. I think there's a lot of good content out there. We try to put out a good bit on the, the Hexus performance Instagram of sort of simple demos of how you can make a homemade pizza from tortillas and some passata and, and some, some fresh natural ingredients, those kind of things. So stuff that you'd have at home, there's, there's lots of resources there. So if people want to dive in and have a look that, you know, that's great. I think there's lots of other practitioners doing some great stuff as well. Um, Daniel Davey back in Ireland is is done some fantastic stuff with food too. So he's got plenty of good good food on the go most evenings. So yeah, I would say definitely drop in and, and check out a few of those channels. Um, there's, I mean, also, I mean, if you are a if you are an adolescent athlete, speak to your parents. They've probably fed you for the last however old you are, many years of your life. So they definitely have some some knowledge that they can pass on. And, and then if you want to include some ingredients to help your recovery, like a bit more protein from some Greek yogurt or some milk, then I'm sure they'll be able to find ways to build that in too. So where can people find out more about you and about Hexus app? So website, social media accounts, et cetera, where can people track you down? Sure. So uh, Instagram and, and the website is definitely the best place for Hexus. So Instagram, we're at Hexus underscore performance and then just hexusapp.com. They'd be the best places to, to find information. Um, if you're interested in recipes, I'll be doing all of my recipes, that kind of thing over there. Um, 
outside of that, people can find me on Twitter uh, at the nutritionizer. So just nutritionist spelt with an or at the end, which was, I suppose, a play on when I started off at Harlequins, I got my, my key card for the building on day one. And, and that was, that was my title. Apparently that's what I was given just nutritionizer. Uh, someone in the office mis misspelled nutritionist and, and it hung around since then. <laughs> yeah. I like that. The nutritionizer sounds like a superhero. Something like that. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thanks very, very much for your time today, mate. I know that's been useful and, and best of luck with the app. I know, you know, obviously, as you said, you're still still developing it and trying to improve it even further, but it looks like a great solution for a lot of people who maybe, you know, lack that education or that awareness to understand how to, how to build things out for themselves. Hopefully, hopefully. It's, it's an iterative process, but look, thanks a million for having me and uh, good to catch up.